All right, well, it's 7.30, so let's get started. So thank you everybody for joining us tonight. Um, my name is Tara, I'm a dietitian. I'm here with Chelsea Piers Fitness. And tonight we are going to have a diet debate. So let me go ahead and introduce myself. Okay, so my name is Tara. I, again, I'm a registered dietitian. I have two bachelor's degrees, one in psychology and one in nutrition science. I also have a minor in English. And I also have my master's in um, applied nutrition with a concentration in nutrition education. For the last eight years, I've focused in weight management and bariatrics. Um, I really enjoy nutrition counseling. And as a side note, I'm actually training for the New York City Marathon next year. So I also have like an interest in fitness as well as healthy eating. So today we have four trainers that will be discussing different diets. We have Dorian Lewis with the ketogenic diet. We have Andrew Berlin with the Mediterranean diet. We have Kelly Dubois with the Nutrivore diet. And we have Zach Fado with the vegetarian diet. Mm. All right. Uh, Thank you, Tara, for that introduction. Um, so my name is Don Lewis. I'm one of the personal trainers here at Chelsea Pierce Fitness. Um, today I'll be going over the ketogenic diet. Uh, in between, I'm gonna take slightly little pauses so that Tara can chime in and give her expertise in case I miss something or she wants to add on extra stuff uh, before we move on to the next slides. All right, so kind of an introduction to the ketogenic diet. Obviously, it's similar to what we call the Atkins diet because they both deal with a uh, low amount of carbs high fat and a moderate amount of protein. Uh, the big difference between the two is the Atkins diet typically gives you a little bit more carbs in the keto diet. Uh, the keto diet, diet was typically made for uh, younger and children that had epilepsy. Not going too deep into epilepsy, but it's pretty much just a neurological disease where they'll typically have episodes um, from it. Um, some of the big factors of the keto diet, along with any other diet, as it, it progresses, it becomes new styles of integrating that diet. So there are four different types of the ketogenic diet. Uh, the first was a standard ketogenic diet. So that's a ratio of a seven to one. And what that pretty much means is you have your 70% fat, 20% protein, and then your 10% of your carbs. Um, two other styles they just came out was pretty much you have this cycling diet, which is pretty much you kind of go five days on, then you take five days off to kind of get your carbs back in. And then you have the target ketogenic diet, which is similar, except you have higher amount of carbs based on your kind of your program or your workouts for the day. So if you're doing something more higher intensity. And then the last one is known as the high protein ketogenic diet. It's like it says, you have a little bit more protein, but the fat source is still your biggest contribution. Um, with the cycling and the target, pretty much those are more for like your athletes that need a certain amount of carbs to make it through their workouts or to sustain their size. Uh, those two are typically for those athletes. The standard one is typically what every other member or clients would use when it comes to the ketogenic diet. All right. Thank you. And let me comment quickly on why the ketogenic diet is used to control epilepsy. It's used con to control epilepsy because the body ends up using ketones, which is one source of fuel that the body can use. It's not a preferential source of protein typically. However, with epilepsy, um, the ketones can cross the blood brain barrier and actually be used as a source. And because it will be a constant source using the fat for energy, it helps control seizure activity in the brain. All right, so obviously with any diet, you have foods that you wanna eat and then stuff that you need to avoid. Uh, some of the bigger factors, junk food with any other diet, uh, anything high in sugar, uh, high in carbs as well. Uh, some of the big factors or mistakes that some people make is uh, unnecessary eating, uh, eating too much calories, and then eating stuff that are supposed to be like low carb uh, on the labels, but really they're not, there's like high starch. So there's other things that kind of contribute to those carbohydrates. Uh, some of the other factors is fruit and they like to drink a lot. Beer has a high amount of sugar in it. So you gotta take that into factum along with the sodium amount. 
Same thing for like anything as far as uh, banana or oranges. The high sugar content will may throw off your ketogenic diet and cause you to have a kind of a relapse when it comes to it. Very true. So fruit is one of those things you'll see at the on the pyramid here that fruit is at the top. Now it's important to note that fruit is not the enemy. However, fruits like berries, you'll see berries are at the top. It's easy to remember. Berries are the best. They have a lot of fiber in them. They have a lot of nutrition. So those are the ones you want to go for. A lot of people will look for around really about 60 grams of carbohydrates per day when you're on the ketogenic diet. So just as a reference point, a banana has 30 grams of carbs in it. So that would be half your day right there. Um, so I do like this keto pyramid because it shows what the diet should mostly consist of. And you'll see there on the right hand side, there's healthy fats, a lot of vegetables, and then your protein. So this is really what's gonna make you feel full and satisfied is the fiber in the vegetables, the protein in the meat, and then the healthy fats will slow down digestion and make you feel full. The things to limit are the ones higher to the top, like dairy and um, we do have nuts and seeds up there. Those are actually kind of okay on the ketogenic diet, but the main thing you won't see any processed carbohydrates. There's no bread, there's no cereal, there's no pasta. So really just eliminating, eliminating those really um, refined carbohydrates and eating exactly like it sounds, high fat, low carb, high protein. All right, so with every diet, there's always a pro and a con to it. It's pro. Uh, you become a fat burning machine. You start losing weight very quickly. Um, you want to make sure you kind of control it. Uh, obviously, every diet is not meant for every person. It kind of dictates on the individual themselves. But kind of going back to what Tara said, so ketones. So what happens is your body pretty much can create ketones for the brain to kind of still be able to function. Your brain can't run on fat. It has to be running on carbohydrates. So that's where the ketones kind of come in play. Uh, the rest of the body can be fueled by fat to still get you throughout your day. Uh, when the body started creating these ketones, pretty much that's when you go into ketosis. That's the, pretty much the phase that you know, now my body is burning the fat instead of using the carbohydrates as my source of energy. Now, with that being said, with any diet, there's always some cons to it. Uh, the biggest con when it comes to ketogenic diet is uh, the keto flu. Now, the flu affects people differently depending on their body and how the body kind of processes it. So some people may get it, some people may not. It all dictates on individual and uh, structure of the body. Uh, some of the things you might get is you might smell fruity breath, get dizzy a little bit, uh, feel nauseous, get a lot of head headaches, and that's pretty much just your body trying to adapt to the new way of creating energy. So because you're not using carbohydrates anymore, you're using fat, your body's trying to pretty much adjust to the new way of its functioning. Uh, some of the biggest factors that come into that is because you are now on a different type of diet, you are a lower amount in sodium. So some of the things to kind of help combat this, sodium, iron, stuff to get your nutrition in that you're not getting on a daily basis because you're cutting out the carbohydrates and other minerals you normally will have on a daily basis. Absolutely. So having some, a little bit of sodium is perfect if you do get that Atkins flu or keto flu because just like Doran said, when you're eliminating the carbohydrates, you're eliminating the main source of fuel. So the body, it's difficult to d adapt to. Um, number one on the cons, it's because our body prefers to use carbohydrates for energy, specifically our heart and our brain like carbohydrates. However, we need our heart and our brain so it can use alternative sources of fuel, which are the ketones, which are what what is produced when the body is breaking down fat for energy? Now, we did have a question um, previous from one of the uh, attendees about intermittent fasting. So intermittent fasting goes along with this diet. So it says, and some people do certain windows of like how long they wait to eat. So intermittent fasting is just like it sounds. It's not eating. So certain people will skip two meals a day. Some will skip one. My opinion is that it's actually bringing us back to more mindful eating because we're going to eat in this way that gives us a concentrated source of energy with the fat. We can 
go a long time without needing snacks or frequent meals throughout the day. So intermittent fasting goes along with this. Um, so if you're going to start intermittent fasting, I would say start it with the ketogenic diet so that you don't feel so deprived and you don't feel that complete lack of energy. Another thing that does happen when you eat this way is because your body is using ketones versus carbohydrates, you're going to notice that the weight actually comes right off your stomach. So I highly recommend before starting this diet, doing your um, waist circumference measurements because when our body takes the insulin and takes the carbohydrates, it actually puts the extra energy on our stomach. So you'll really notice that visceral fat start to shrink. And to note, the visceral fat is the one that's really not good for us. We've always heard apple shape versus pear shape. It's not very good to have fat around your stomach because that's where all of our internal organs are. So obviously we don't have to have a lot of fat in there. So that's one real actually pro of this diet is that you're going to lose fat and you're going to lose it right from where you don't want the fat. All right, and now on to the Mediterranean diet. Good evening, everyone. <clears throat> My name is Andrew Berlin. I'm one of the master trainers at Chelsea Pierce, Connecticut. I'm going to be talking about the Mediterranean diet, which actually isn't a diet. It's a lifestyle choice. Um, so what is the Mediterranean diet? It's adopted from the generations of Mediterranean peoples, their foods, and active, healthy lifestyle. Um, it has a number of health benefits as well. Uh, it's going to lower chances of type 2 diabetes, heart disease, uh, cancer. It's preventative, so it's going to help you live longer. And uh, I actually wanted Tara to chime in on brain health related to the Mediterranean diet. Absolutely. So one thing that's included in the Mediterranean diet is fatty fish and omega-3 fatty acids. So that is imperative for brain health, um, as well as just healthy fats in general. The main fat source in this diet is pretty much olive oil, and that is really the best fat that you can have. So versus the ketogenic diet, where you're allowed to have fat from animals, this diet, actually, I'm going to say lifestyle, really focuses on healthy fat. And thank you so much for mentioning the lifestyle. Um, I believe we're going to have a Mediterranean pyramid in the next couple of slides. So I'm going to talk about the lifestyle then as well. So thank you. Yeah. So looking at the pyramid, trying to keep everything uh, in moderation at the top, trying to focus on everything at the bottom. So the nuts and fruits and legumes, all the vegetables and healthy oils and fats, trying to keep lean meats, right? Um, fish and chicken and some moderation. Um, and then with these choices, you're also trying to adapt an active, healthy lifestyle, right? So we're trying to incorporate more exercise, better sleep, and ultimately trying to de-stress as much as we can. Perfect. Thank you. So again, this is the pyramid uh, that we've been talking about. So down in the bottom, it includes being physically active, eating meals with family and friends, and really making it a whole lifestyle versus just diet alone. So this one really incorporates overall health and wellness. As I said, I have a degree in psychology, so I'm, very, I'm a very big proponent of the importance of mental health, physical health, in addition to eating healthfully. So this is really makes this a, again, lifestyle versus just diet, because it really um, shows how having a healthy body requires doing healthy things beyond just diet, you know, um, being physically active. So it really encompasses everything. Also, there's wine. <laughs> yes, a little bit of red wine is allowed in moderation. And actually, the best red wine to have is the organic red wine. It has resveratrol, which is good for your heart. And wine in moderation can actually raise your HDLs, your healthy cholesterol. So there is science and it, that is supported. So a lot of people do see that as a benefit. <laughs> totally. Um, and then we're talking about all the health benefits of having a healthy lifestyle. 
we're going to have better heart health, diabetic prevention, um, trying to stave off cancers, trying to prevent mortality, right? Um, and it's environmentally friendly because it's mostly plant-based. Um, what are the best things that you've seen in people of certain populations ad adopting this kind of a diet? Absolutely. And one thing I also want to comment on with the Mediterranean diet is this is popular in Italy. So I kind of want to talk about the intermittent fasting in regards to the Mediterranean diet. So one thing I hear clients say all the time is that they don't want to eat late at night. So really there's no basis for that. Eating late at night won't actually make you gain weight. The problem with it is that some people make it into their fourth meal. So people will have three meals a day and then they'll have their fourth meal at night. So it's really just more calories. But I want to mention in Italy, they obviously eat a Mediterranean diet. They walk everywhere and they don't eat until late at night. So it kind of, I just want to say that not eating if you're not hungry isn't bad. I'm a huge proponent of mindful eating. And so if you're going to eat when you're hungry and stop when you're no longer hungry, that's the important thing to do and to listen to your body. So I kind of wanted to bring back the idea of intermittent fasting. It's okay to eat late at night as long as you're eating the amount of calories that you need for your body and balancing it out with activity. Now, are there anything, are there any cons that you can think of that are just monumental, they're, you know, difficult to stick to, they're, you know, prepping food and cooking for yourself as opposed to going out to eat with the Mediterranean diet? Not really. Um, the Mediterranean lifestyle is a very easy to incorporate into the diet. Sometimes I've seen challenges if clients have self-proclaimed sugar addictions and things like that really um, have a lot of food that really doesn't, and I use food like with a question mark because I would say food, things like potato chips, cookies, things that are really calorie and sugar dense, but don't have a lot of nutrition. So sometimes it's difficult or if somebody's a picky eater, it'd be difficult to eat this healthy way. But if eating healthy is a priority, this is actually, you know, a nice way to eat. Totally. Thanks, Tara. Thank you. On to the Nutrivore diet. Thank you, Tara. I am Kelly Dubois. I'm a master trainer at Chelsea Piers, also a group fitness instructor and a nutrition coach. And I'm excited to be here. I'm here to talk to you about the Nutribor diet. I actually like to call it a nutrition plan. Um, Nutribor was coined by Dr. Sarah Ballantyne, AKA new, uh, Paleo Mom. And I actually think this term is brilliant. I love it. Um, it is similar to paleo, but not quite as restrictive. And the Nutrivor nutrition plan consists of nutrient dense, anti-inflammatory, blood stabilizing whole foods. I like to call these foods high performance foods. That's exactly what they are. And these foods are nutritious. They provide the micronutrients that we need to thrive, not just survive. Um, we can survive on processed foods, but nobody can thrive on processed foods, um, AKA the uh, standard American diet, which is what everyone needs to get away from. And uh, these foods also, the uh, foods on the Nutrivore diet also promote gut health, which is something that we should all be thinking about. Uh, we are realizing in nutrition science more and more how important gut health is, not only for disease prevention, but also for fat loss and uh, just better body composition. So the Nutrivore plan focuses on micronutrients. Uh, there isn't a big focus on macronutrients, the fats, carbohydrates, 
and protein percentages. That, those things are very bio-individual. Um, some people do well on high fat. Some people do well on low fat. Same with carbohydrates. Some people need less carbohydrates and some people need more carbohydrates. And also with the car carbohydrates, that is very um, activity based. Um, so even, even if you're a person who does well on high carbohydrates, if you have a high activity day, you're probably not going to need as much carbohydrate as you would on a low activity day. Um, so determining your macronutrients is something that you can do with trial and error and it takes some time. You have to play around with it. You, if you're uncertain with how to get there, I suggest seeking out a, uh, registered dietitian like Tara, she would be my first choice or even a uh, nutrition coach. So it, it's, it's not an easy thing to determine, but it is definitely worth the trial and error. And some of the things that you wanna look at when, when you're trying to figure this out are how you feel after each meal. Like you wanna look at your energy levels after a meal, um, whether or not you have bloating, whether or not your bowels are moving properly, and those, those types of things are going to tell you whether or not you have hit the right macros for yourself. Uh, one of the things that I want to point out, going back to micronutrients and eating whole foods, is that if you look at the, the definition of food, the definition of food is a substance that you put in your body that helps you, that increases your energy, promotes healthy growth, and helps you to, well, I'm using the wrong word, not thrive, but sustains life. There you go, there's, there's the right word. And processed foods, refined foods, do the exact opposite of those things, um, which is why I call them non-foods. Processed foods drain you of your energy, they promote disease, they mess up your gut biome, and therefore they're really not foods. So we all need to get away from these processed foods which have become so popular in the last 100 years because they are easy and a lot of them taste delicious, but they are terrible for us. So if I could have the next slide, that would be great. Absolutely. And I just want to comment. I could not have said that better myself. I love the way you said that, that we need healthy food to thrive. That is essential because nutrition is something we don't see right away. Um, nutrition is something that develops over time. So eventually professionals, like I can actually see vitamin and mineral deficiencies on nails and hair on the skin but nutrition isn't something we see right away. So the way that you said that was absolutely perfect, that we need real food to nourish our body, give it the vitamins and minerals that it needs for really optimal functioning. So thank you. Thank you. And I just want to um, add to that. Um, most people don't realize how bad they feel until they start eating the foods that their body needs, the foods that nourish their bodies, and then they realize how great they feel. And it is amazing what the difference is when you're giving your body what your body needs. So some of the good foods, some of the foods that you want to include with the Nutrivore plan are grass-fed beef, wild-caught fish, bone broth, pastured poultry, pastured pork. Um, when it comes to the animal proteins, just like humans, these animals like cows and pigs and chickens and turkeys, they were meant to eat certain foods. And if they're not eating the foods that they were supposed, that they're meant to eat, they're animal protein is not healthy for us. 
So grain-fed beef is not healthy. And a lot of the studies that have been done on beef causing cancer have been done using grain-fed beef and also processed meats. So there you go. Um, also on the Nutrivor plan, pastured eggs are great. Wild game, organ meats. Organ meats are probably the most nutrient dense animal proteins. Um, personally, I hate liver, but I tell everybody, try to get yourself to eat it because it is so nutrient dense. Uh, vegetables, fill your plate with vegetables. That's so important for all of the vitamins, minerals, and antioxidants. Fruits, fresh fruits are great. I recommend berries as being the first choice. And fruits do have sugar. So when, when I talk to people who are trying to lose fat, um, I recommend no more than one serving of fruits a day. And again, I think berries are the best. Starchy plants are great. Tubers are great. You need to be careful with, if you're looking at your calories and trying to reduce your calories, those are going to be more caloric than leafy green vegetables. Um, healthy fats. So some of the healthy fats are extra virgin olive oil, coconut oil, grass-fed butter is great, ghee is great, avocado oil is one of my favorites. Um, it has a, a unique flavor. I personally love it. And for treats, uh, cacao. So very dark chocolate. Um, when, I, when I recommend dark chocolate, I tell people that they should look for chocolate that is 70% cacao or more, nothing less than that. And it is uh, an acquired taste. I personally don't like it. <laughs> so, um, but a lot of my clients who uh, gave me some pushback in the beginning have now really adjusted to it and love it. I have one client who told me the other day that she's eating 95% cacao dark chocolate. And I was like, yikes, that's impressive. Um, also nuts and seeds, if you tolerate them, not everyone tolerates nuts and seeds, but they do have some healthy fat and some micronutrients. And foods to avoid on the Nutrivor plan, sugar. Sugar is public enemy number one. It's highly addictive. It does us no good. It drains us of energy. I mean, I'm sure that you all have experienced that sugar high when you've eaten something that is high in sugar. And yeah, you get an energy rush for like the first 30 minutes and then your energy is on the floor for the next several hours. So what's the point? Uh, Grain-fed beef, I mentioned that before, that grain-fed beef is not healthy for us. Processed foods, obviously not healthy. Unpastured poultry and farmed fish are not the best choices. Also, uh, PUFAs are something that you should avoid. These are polyunsaturated fatty acids like canola oil, grapeseed oil, corn oil, soybean oil, generic, generic vegetable oil. These are all very inflammatory. Um, even flaxseed oil is very inflammatory. And flaxseed is something that has been glorified because of its uh, ALA content, which is the mother molecule of um, some good fatty acids. But the minute flaxseed oil sees light or air, it starts to, it, it becomes, uh, it oxidizes and it's very inflammatory. So those are some of the foods that you should avoid. And now I'm going to talk a little bit about the pros and cons of the Nutrivor plan. Perfect. Let me just quickly yeah. mention, you mentioned liver. So liver is the highest source of iron that pretty much we can get. And it's 
it's really bioavailable, meaning that we absorb most of the iron that we eat. Actually, about 70% of the population is low in iron. So, and those, you can, you'll find those um, levels up by your doctor. They can run tests on your hemoglobin, hematocrit, total iron binding capacity, your ferritin. So your doctor will let you know where you stand on that. And, but if you're low in iron or even slightly low in iron, there are physical symptoms. Um, one thing is you'll get ridged nails, have a really pale pal pallor and feel extremely fatigued. So, and what's unique about liver is that it's different from iron pills that we could take. A lot of people record, or a lot of like physicians or healthcare practitioners will recommend um, iron supplements. And that's great, but one side effect is that it causes a lot of constipation. That's not so great. But if you're getting your liver from or your iron from real food like liver, the body's gonna absorb it and it's gonna know what, how to process it and absorb it well. Another tip with that is have it with something that has vitamin C. So if you have liver, have it with some vegetables because vitamin C is gonna help en enhance the absorption of the iron. So it's really gonna, going to optimize the nutrition that you're getting from the food. Good advice, Tara, thank you. Um, all right, so pros with the Nutribor plan, fat loss, better body composition, disease prevention, and uh, anti-inflammatory, which goes along with disease prevention. The more foods that we eat that are anti-inflammatory and not inflammatory will help us prevent disease. Uh, the foods on this plan promote gut health, which I mentioned before, very important. We should all be paying attention to that. And also this plan is hormone balancing and it's simple. It really is simple, which is not to say that it's easy. I like to tell people, I mean, let me put it this way. It's simple because you can eat it if you can kill it pick it or dig it. That's pretty simple, but it's not easy because it does require a lot of food prep. And that's one of the cons. And then also the early adjustments. That's another con, um, trying to determine your metabolic type and exactly what macronutrient percentages are gonna be best for you. That does take time. And again, a professional can help you with that if you, if you need the help. And that's it, thank you very much. And thank, I wanna come in really quick too. Thank you for mentioning gut and the immunity. Our gut is responsible for most of our immune system actually. So, and I'm sure we've all had a stomach ache or a foodborne illness that made us feel really crummy. And we realized how much our gut is responsible for. So especially now during times like COVID, we want our immunity to be top priority. So really they have a saying that we are what we eat and that couldn't be more true. And really we are what we eat. So if we eat well, we're gonna feel well. If we eat like not so great, we're not gonna feel so great. So really, um, at the end of the day, what this comes down to is eating real food, eating whole foods, eating real foods. And if diet and feeling well are priority, that's how you want to do it. That's how you want to do it. You want to go back to eating real food. So we're going to transition well, now into the vegetarian Kara, diet. Kara, can I just tag on to what you just said? Absolutely. So um, yes, definitely we are what we eat, but also going back to your point with bioavailability, we are what we absorb. Bioavailability is so important. Um, like you mentioned with the liver and adding foods that will help your body absorb rather than relying on supplements. I think that was a wonderful point. Thank you. All right. All right, now on to the vegetarian diet. All right, thank you, Tara. Hello, Chelsea Pierce family. Good evening. Zach Fado, personal trainer here. Now I'm going to go over the vegetarian diet, but uh, real quick before I do that, I just want to touch on two little points. One, you notice how we kind of say lifestyle more than diet. Diet has an end point. You can eat a certain way for four weeks, get some results, and then go back to the way you were eating before. That's going to cause the term called yo-yo dieting. You're going to see some results, then you're going to gain even more weight back. 
And also a second little thing with the processed foods, like Kelly was saying, you want to stay away from the processed foods. Now I'm doing vegetarian. You can go on an aisle and get something that says it's vegetarian, but it could be crammed with sugar and all this stuff that's not good for you, not that your body's going to digest it. So a good little trick, I think some of you might've heard this before, is when you go grocery shopping, stay on the outskirts. Don't go in the aisles. And stay away from the bakery section too. But onto the vegetarian diet now. So a vegetarian diet is a diet that avoids consumption of meat, fish, and poultry. This is not to be confused with a vegan diet. Vegans do not consume any uh, products that anything with animals are no uh, eggs, milk, anything like that, anything that's tested on animals, they do not do that. So Tara, anything else? No, thank you for mentioning eating real food. Um, one thing that I, that I've said before, I was like, you don't want to be a nacho vegetarian because nachos are vegetarian, they're not vegan, but they're vegetarian. So you really want, if you're going to eat mostly, if you're going to eat vegetarian, you have to eat the veg part of it, the vegetable part of it. And uh, I'll go on the foods, but there are little subsections of vegetarians too. Some that allow fish, some that allow dairy, some allow eggs for today, just to make it easy for everyone. We're just going to do a general vegetarian diet. So on that diet, some foods that you do want to eat, your vegetables, any of them, broccoli, asparagus. You want to also go for a vast color of vegetables as well. Get some squash in there, yellow peppers, red peppers, make it a colorful meal. We want to get some fruits as well, but like you've heard, be careful with the amount of fruits. Go for the berries first. Don't eat a bunch of bananas. You're going to have a lot of sugar throughout the day. We're going to have some greens, nuts, legumes. I put tofu in there. That's going to come a little later on when we talk about protein. It's a good source. And then we have your healthy fats, like your avocados and all that. To avoid, very simple, meat, fish, poultry. Avoid them completely. Thank you for mentioning the colors of the rainbow. I say that to literally every single patient who comes in my office, no exaggeration. Each color is associated with a different phytonutrient, phytochemical, vitamin, mineral, like your purples and your reds and your blues have anthocyanins, which are good for your heart. Your vitamin A is in your yellows and your oranges for your beta carotene. So each color equals a different vitamin and mineral. I literally say that to every single patient that comes into my office. So thank you. Nice. So some pros with the vegetarian diet, you're gonna consume more whole foods. If you stay away from that box stuff that says vegetarian on it, you're gonna consume more whole foods, which means you're gonna consume less processed foods. And like Kelly said before, people might not realize how bad they feel until they start to cut out those processed foods and really realize what they should be feeling like. The vegetarian diet is also gonna improve some heart health. It's gonna improve your digestion. That goes back to the whole foods as well. Whole foods over processed foods. Your stomach will thank you. And there is an ethical issue, issue, ethical virtue as well. Uh, some people do it for the humane reasons and that's completely up to them to each his own. Now, some of the cons with a vegetarian diet, you may lack nutrients, especially vitamin B12, which is normally found in animal proteins. And I love how Kelly said uh, grass fed over grain fed. I 100% agree with that. We also, we're not only what we eat, we are what, what we eat eats. So the food that we consume has to have good nutrients for their eating as well. So we're going to have some fewer food choices on a vegetarian diet. Just like any diet, it's going to have some restrictions on it. Nothing to be too concerned about. A lot of vegetarians have problems consuming enough protein. This is where you're going to have to get some proper planning. You're going to have to plan your meals. You can't just go and eat lettuce all the time and consider yourself vegetarian. Your stomach will not, not thank you. So that's where the tofu comes into play. That's a good little protein source that you can season however you want. Now, another con is going to be the social aspect. So going out with friends, going to birthday parties, stuff like that, going out to dinner. Now that restaurants are open again, <laughs> you're going to want to call ahead. So it's simple planning. Call the restaurant, see if they have any vegetarian, vegan options for you. And just do some planning ahead. Thank you for mentioning calling the restaurant ahead of time. One of the dietitians that I used to work with, she used to work at 
Texas Roadhouse. And so she would actually tell people if you were choosing the baked potato as a vegetarian option, it's not vegetarian because they actually roll it in bacon grease to make it taste better. So that is a very essential point, especially if you're following a vegetarian diet for ethical and moral reasons. You don't want to accidentally have something that might have animal byproducts in it. And with the vegetarian diet, you mentioned B12. That's an area where I actually would recommend a supplement because it is pretty hard to get your B12 without eating meat. And the reason why I would recommend a supplement because it's water soluble, meaning that if you don't absorb it, the body's just gonna get rid of it. You'll actually know if your supplement has B12 because your urine will be bright yellow. So just if you follow um, a vegetarian diet, keep your B12 in mind and consider a supplement just to kind of um, fill in any nutrition gaps. I did not know that about the potatoes. That's also shows you, you never know what you're really consuming. Maybe when you're at a restaurant. Food is going to be the best. You know what you're putting in it. All right, and now we've actually reached the end of our presentation. So we do have some questions that we received. One that we received before the presentation was about what kind of eating is gonna to lead to the quickest weight loss. That will actually be your ketogenic diet because when you limit your carbohydrate intake, you lose a lot of your water weight. So it leads to fast weight loss and so a lot of times people like that because it kind of gives them the motivation they need to keep going because when you start losing weight, you feel better and then, you know, it gives you motivation to keep going. That being said, we've, kind of, we've talked a lot tonight about things being a lifestyle. I'm sure everybody remembers when Adkins was really popular and everybody went on Adkins and then they lost a ton of weight and then they gained it back plus more. That is actually more dangerous um, to yo-yo diet and lose weight and gain it back because it really it messes with the body's homeostasis essentially. So you really want something to be a lifestyle. Like say you start off with the keto diet for fast weight loss and then transition to the Mediterranean. That would be recommended a little bit, a little bit more because you want something that's going to be something that you can maintain long-term. Sure, to kind of time in onto that. So to add on to it pretty much with the ketogenic diet, even though you have these certain numbers, those are just recommendations. Those are not like set in stone. You can always start your way up small and then work your way up to those recommendations. That way your body has time to adjust to it. That's why with every, every type of diet, it's always like a beginning phase and then you go kind of into the more advanced version. Going straight all in, you're setting yourself up a failure. So it's always good to start off small and then work your way gradually into that diet. Perfect. Thank you. So we've had a few questions. Um, Paul asks if we can get liver through pate. Absolutely. Liver pate is pretty much ground up liver. Again, it's going to be really bioavailable. So that's going to be um, preferential, similar to protein. And I want to mention also the bioavailability of certain proteins. So whenever we as nutrition professionals look at how much protein is absorbed from a certain food, we rank it on the scale. It's called the protein digestibility amino acid scoring system. It's a long name, meaning how much protein is absorbed from this food. And actually eggs have the highest biological value source of protein out of anything. So that's something to keep in mind as well if you're doing the um, vegetarian diet, the bioavailability and considering eggs depending on which um, versions of vegetarian you choose. And one thing before I answer some more questions is I, want, I brought this sign that I actually have hanging up in my office, but I feel like it encompasses everything that we've been talking about tonight. So, all right. So it says, if it came from a plant, eat it. If it was made in a plant, don't. So this is a quote from Michael Pollan. He's a food writer and he's really all about eating whole foods. But I feel like that quote just sums it up. If it came from a plant, eat it. If it was made at a plant and processed, don't. 
So that's one quote that I really like because I feel like it sums up nutrition into something that's more tangible. Um, one thing I always say is that we make nutrition so complicated and it is a science, but leave that up to me. Leave that up to me to know like where the carbons are and the double bonds and all of that. When it comes to healthy eating is going back to eating real food, things that came from mother nature essentially. So let's see what other questions we have here. Well, we got a question from Maria. What is ex recommended exercise-wise to complement your food and nutrition diet? That would actually be a, one of the trainer's questions. Oh, mm. and you got one? I guess I'll chime in for this one. Um, so one of the biggest things that people think is burning more calories will burn more fat. Uh, it's been proven that is not the case. Uh, if you really actually want to lose weight, high interval training is going to be one of the biggest factors in it. So actually strength training mixed in with cardio workouts will work a lot more efficiently than just trying to sweat out all the carbs, carbs you can. So mixing, finding out exactly how much calories you're taking in and how much of an intensity level you can actually work at. So it's going to be different for each person based off of their coach or trainer and their actual goals and being smart about how much they can actually use periodically throughout the week. I love how you said it's very individualized because that is true. It's based on your goals and what works for you. The diet that works for me isn't going to be the diet that works for Tara, just like the training program that works for Andrew isn't going to be the same tra training program that works for Kelly. You need to find what works with your body. I forget who said it, but I think it was Kelly. It's talked about listening to your body, your stool, your energy levels, your skin, all of that are little cues that you need to um, take note of all throughout the day. Now, going into individuality too, it depends. If you're trying to gain muscle, you need to be in a caloric surplus. So you need to be eating healthy foods and eat a little bit more than you're burning throughout the day. Opposite goes true. If you're trying to burn fat, you need to eat a little less than you burn throughout the day. So this is a very individualized question. You would actually want to sit down with the somebody and go through what would be a good training uh, program for you and nutrition program. Well said. And kind of to add on to that, you also got to take in the factor of your work style. So if you're someone who sits at a desk a lot, that's also going to play in the factor of how hard can you actually work? Do you have any injuries? So there's going to be a lot of different factors that play in. That's why you want to actually sit down with a coach or a trainer and kind of go over exactly what are your limitations? What can you actually physically do? that's also not gonna hurt you in the long run. Awesome. Absolutely, as with everything, everything is individualized and that's when working with trainers for your fitness, depending on your fitness goals, is, per is what you, basically what you need to do. <laughs> Just like working with a dietitian like me on your diet is really gonna make your plan personalized. I will take lab results that I see and I will actually break down macronutrients and give patients advice on how many carbs, fat, grams of protein I recommend. And that will coincide with the fitness trainer's plans on your goals for fitness. So really working with an expert is really how you're going to get the most personalized and individual attention for your specific body needs. So I have a question for Kelly from Dawn. How do legumes figure in the Nutrivore plan? All right, legumes. One of my favorite foods because I grew up in New Mexico and I gave it up years ago because legumes are, they are not extremely nutrient dense. They do have a nice um, protein profile and carbohydrate profile, but they also have anti-nutrients. I still eat legumes occasionally i introduced them back into my life about two years ago and i consider them a treat um, because they are not the most nutrient dense and because they do have some anti-nutrients so when i do have them i prepare them properly if you're going to add legumes to your nutrition plan um, the best way to prepare them is to soak them for 24 hours, and that is going to decrease their anti-nutrient content. 
and, or minimize it. And um, like I said, consider it a treat. I, I, I wouldn't recommend having them every day, but it's not the worst thing you can eat, obviously. So that's my take on legumes. <laughs> And also, Kelly, while we have you, um, Joanna asked, can you name a few tubers? Yes. Uh, sweet potatoes would be my number one tu uh, tuber for nutrient density. White potatoes are fine. In the paleo world, white potatoes have gotten a bad rep, and they actually are pretty nutrient dense. Um, I have found for myself that my energy levels are better when I eat sweet potatoes than they are when I eat white potatoes. Although I prefer the taste of white potatoes, but like I said, I, I go for high energy. So um, I make myself eat sweet potatoes. Um, also radishes are great. Uh, uh, parsnips and uh, what else, Tara? Help me out with this. I think that's a pretty good, mainly when I think of tubers, I think of potatoes. Yeah. But I like how you mentioned the sweet potatoes versus the white potatoes. Again, it goes back to eating the rainbow. Your sweet potato is going to have more beta carotene um, and vitamin A in it. They actually recently came out with white sweet potatoes, which I still don't know the science behind it, but it's like a potato that tastes like a sweet potato, but it's white. So kind of like, I have to look into the science about yeah, it. I actually did try that. I forget the name of it, but um, I tried it and I, I, I like the, the orange sweet, sweet potatoes better. So it, it seems like it's re more real because it's something that we know when we keep saying going back to eating real food. So I feel right. like if you're going to have the sweet potato, you might as well have it like it looks like a sweet potato. Exactly. So those uh, white sweet potatoes are pretty much from the islands. They're normally in Jamaica and also in China. They call yams. So you normally won't see them in like a stop and shop. You'll see them probably in a Whole Foods or a farmer's market in different locations. Yeah, I think we actually got ours in um, stop and shop or shop right. So I guess they're becoming like more readily available. Yeah. So um, I have another question for um, Kelly. What are anti-nutrients? Uh, there are many anti-nutrients. Uh, saponones are one, and saponones are gut irritants, which is why they're an anti-nutrient. Uh, lectins are another, and um, oh my goodness, I had a whole list. Do you want the whole list? <laughs> I've got a bunch of them. Also, uh, things like nitrates I would consider anti-nutrients. Is that on your list? I'm sorry, what? Nitrates? Uh, yes, nitrates, absolutely. So, um, which is why when, it, if you're going to choose bacon or Canadian bacon or ham, you definitely want to get those products that are nitrate free. Uh, isoflavins are another anti-nutrient. Uh, what else? Oxalates, oxalates. And you know what, this is a good point. Let me bring this up. So we, as a health community, uh, I should say, or fitness community, have gotten very much into smoothies, which are great. I, I think smoothies work well for a lot of people. Um, it's a quick, easy breakfast or a quick, easy snack. But if you are putting raw spinach or raw kale into your smoothies, you're getting a lot of oxalates, which promote kidney, um, kidney stones. And if, if you have a family history of kidney stones, ah, kidney stones, you can decrease the oxalate content of spinach and kale by slightly steaming it. So if you want to add those two things to your smoothies or if, you know, if you're just eating them as a side dish to a meal, make sure that you steam them at least a little bit. And water. 
if you have a history of right. stones, water is essential. And that's actually, it's really interesting that that came up talking about anti-nutrients because the USDA is actually now looking at that my plate that we use. Um, if you don't know what it is, just go to www.myplate.gov. That's what we're using for our nutrition recommendations as for the general population right now. But they're actually trying to get water on that plate, which I completely, I don't know why water is a macronutrient like carbs, fat, and protein, because we need it to live. Water is actually more important than food. Absolutely. Um, yeah, so, but they actually consider an anti, it's the lack of nutrients, why it hasn't been in our um, American uh, dietary guidelines for Americans. So I thought that it was really interesting how that kind of all segued into one, but water is more important than food. So sorry, Kelly, were you going to say something too? No, I, that was it. So let's see. So Paul asked, what is the best diet if you have yo-yoed many times and now have a metabolism that seems to be stuck? I'm biased, but going to see a dietitian. So I used to actually measure metabolism. I had a machine called indirect calorimetry. I'm not sure if there's, I'm sure there's somebody in this area who does it. I'm just not sure who now. Um, so you can actually get your metabolism tested and it's actually called indirect calorimetry. Um, but also working with a dietitian, like I said, I can look at certain lab values and pretty much understand how your metabolism is working. So working with a dietitian and also working with a trainer to complement the diet to help you really get your body working for you and really burning more fat for energy um, and working with your body. Awesome. I would also say just Take it slow too. A lot of people dive head first into diets and overwhelm themselves. Take it very slow, one small step at a time. Try to get one healthy lifestyle choice every two to three weeks, even if it's just drinking more water, trying to get a little bit more protein or half of your plate with vegetables. Work on one thing at a time instead of doing everything at once. That should help you out. Great advice, Zach. And kind of to add on to that, if you're having like the yo-yo effect where you're trying all these different diets, um, how long are you staying with that diet, to be, be honest? Are you with it for a week and then you don't see results, so you swap to a new diet? That will also play a factor. If you yeah. don't have your diet, make sure you stick with it for a long period of time. Not all diets are going to operate and change within a week. Some of them take a little bit longer. Some of them take a month, actually, before your body starts to adjust to it. So always keep that a factor. Exactly. So Donna asked, can long-term intermittent fasting cause damage to organs or create hormonal imbalances over a long time? And I do want to mention, if you have diabetes type 1 or type 2, don't start intermittent fasting unless you're under the supervision of like a medical professional. That can be fatal. So I do want to mention that. That's imperative. Um, so intermittent fasting... Um, Depends on how you're doing it. I've had people go days without eating and I wouldn't really recommend that because essentially what the body's doing, like when you skip a meal, the body shoots out um, hormones. Like one of them is peptide YY and that actually slows down metabolism. So you stop feeling hungry and uncomfortable. So you really, and our goal here is to keep the metabolism working for us. So the ketogenic diet works in that it uses fat for energy and not carbohydrates. But if you're really ignoring your hunger cues and eating or not eating when your stomach is growling, that's just going to be kind of productive. It's all about mindful eating, eating when you're hungry and stopping when you're no longer hungry hungry. And notice I didn't say eat until you're full. It does take time for the body to realize that it's full. So you want to eat when you're hungry and stop when you're no longer hungry. And I also want to uh, mention another quote by Michael Pollan, that food writer. He said, if you're really hungry, you'll be hungry for an apple. But if you're just head hungry, you're going to be hungry for some ice cream. So really, if you're listening to your body and being mindful about what it needs, you kind of, you might actually start intermittent fasting almost unintentionally because if you're not hungry for lunch, if you're not very active, then you're going to find that your body doesn't need as much energy. But if you're very active, you're going to need more meals and snacks throughout the day. So it's all about being mindful. So can you name some nutritional spices? Kelly, do you have any of these? Uh, I'm sorry. I, I couldn't hear you. Uh, can you name some nutritional spices? Charlotte asked that. Oh my God, all spices are great. Uh, thyme, 
um, oregano, uh, garlic. Garlic is a great spice. I, I mean, I can't think of a spice that is not good. I, mean, I love some crushed red pepper. I love there that. you go. Yeah, speed up your metabolism. Mm -hmm. Also, turmeric. Turmeric. Yeah. Oh, yeah, turmeric. Absolutely. Like Dr. Wheel is um, a professional and he actually has like a Dr. Wheel's anti-inflammatory diet, which is pretty much encompassing everything we talked about today, eating real foods, eating whole foods. The red wine is also in there too, organic. Um, but things like turmeric is also anti-inflammatory. So basically if it doesn't have salt, it's going to be good for you. And it's, you, it's probably going to have added benefits on top of it. So that is all the questions that I have on here. Anybody else have any more questions? I think we're coming up on, oh, it's 8.30 actually. So I'll leave like a few seconds for any other questions. Tara, I have a question for you. How do you feel about Himalayan sea salt? It's seen as a health food right now. Um, at the end of the day, it is still salt. It's kind of like, Sea salt was really popular like 10 years ago, I guess. Yeah. Um, and the idea behind that is that it, it was bigger, I guess, crystals of salt. So that the idea was that we used less of it. But at the end of the day, it's still, still salt. So I would say use it in moderation, especially if you have hypertension, you want to limit it to less than less than 2000 milligrams a day. So at the end of the day, it's still, still sodium. Gotcha. Thank you. All right. Well, no other questions are coming through right now. So I want to say thank you to everybody who came today. Thank you to all the fitness trainers. Thank you to Chelsea Pierce Fitness. I think this was a really great event. We had a great, oh, we actually do have one more question. Uh, there's a question. Will, will the, uh, can you, can you provide a replay of this discussion? Would you like to share with friends and families? Can you provide the slides? Wonderful presentation. So thank you. Um, yes, the video was recorded today. So I believe that I'll, I'll, yeah, I will have to ask the host. Um, can I unmute the host and you can answer that? Ask to unmute. Hi, yes, we will be sending out the recording and the slides, um, I believe, on Thursday. Awesome. Great. All right. Well, thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, trainers. Thank you, Chelsea Peers. And um, this was a really great event. Thank you. Thank you, Tara. Tara. Thanks. Howdy. See you in the club. Good night. Bye, guys.